I was drafted. Uh, as a matter of fact, I received my greetings from the president the day I graduated from high school. Where were you living at the time? I was living in Thief River Falls. Okay. And you remember what what was that spring, fall, winter? It was uh, uh, in um, June. June of 1943. When, how much time then did you have before you left for a boot camp someplace? Well, I left for boot camp uh, about the uh, first week in July. Okay. And uh, where was the boot camp? Where, what fort was it at? Well, I was I was processed originally, of course, through uh, Fort Silling at St. Paul and from there they sent me to a uh, boot camp in Fort McClellan, Alabama. Oh, hot. Hot yes. it was. Right hot. And you spent about six weeks down there? Or no, I didn't. Actually, uh, basic training in those days was 17 weeks. 17 oh. weeks long. Uh, in those days. And uh, I was down at Fort McClellan uh, for actually about uh, 20 weeks because there was some delay in my, uh, after I completed basic, there was a delay uh, because I was scheduled to go into a, uh, a, a uh, program, uh, ASTP, it was called, that uh, as it turned out, and I didn't know until a little later on, that the reason for the delay is because the program was canceled. They needed everybody they could get trained and overseas, you know, preparing for D-Day. So I was uh, given a month at home uh, as a delay in uh, a delay in in route to uh, Camp Shanks, New York, and uh, Camp Shanks. I shipped uh, out of there about the oh, r roughly the 25th of uh, January, 1944, and uh, went to Southampton, and uh, I was in a. A replacement camp at that time uh, from which I was uh, then assigned to the uh, 117th Infantry Division of the uh, 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 117th uh, Regiment of the 30th Infantry Division. And uh, actually I went over to um, uh, France uh, and uh, through the Cherbourg area uh, onto the Cherbourg Peninsula uh, about uh, two weeks after D-Day. So it was around the 15th to the 20th of, of uh, um, June is when I went in How'd there. How did you get to Shanks? You get by boat from England? Uh, you go by boat from England? I went by boat from England to Cherbourg, to the Cherbourg Peninsula. And actually it was, uh, we were uh, disembarked at, uh, uh, on Omaha Beach, which was uh, had been secured by uh, the uh, other units, uh, you know, earlier, and uh, was a uh, a landing area where they were transferring uh, people and supplies and so forth, you know, onto the Cherbourg Peninsula, and uh, so we were, you know, in combat on the. Cher Cher Cherbourg Peninsula from um, oh, the time I arrived, which was roughly June 20th, some, somewhere in that 
and I don't recall the exact dates, uh, but it was about that time. And uh, then we went through a, a number of skirmishes and, and battles. And was that in France then? That was in France. That was, uh, and we were actually, we managed to get down uh, by the time we got to the area where I was, uh, was captured in the, the, the major battle uh, uh, of the uh, France, uh, French campaign that took place at a place called Mortain, France. Uh, it was about halfway down the Cherbourg Peninsula and we were still in the hedgerow country, and uh, uh, about uh, two weeks after the uh, Battle of Mortain, why uh, the the uh, armed forces broke out of the hedgerow country and got out got out into open area where the armored divisions could start operating because on the Cherbourg Peninsula, it was just laced everywhere. All of the uh, 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 pastures, farm yards, uh, orchards were um, fenced off by hedgerows, which were uh, a, uh, a mound that was probably 20 feet wide at the bottom and uh, about uh, 12 to 15 feet high and about five feet wide on top uh, of stone and trees and that had accumulated over many, well, about four to 500 years. They've, uh, the, uh, the, the soil in that area was very rocky and to farm it, why the farmers were always picking rocks, they would put them in a pile along the fence line of the, of the uh, field. And uh, eventually, after four or five hundred years of doing that, why they got to be a, a major, major obstacle to any kind of, uh, of movement. But, uh, uh, a great way, great place to fight from, but uh, a, a terrible place to try to to get through. You know. Now but, you uh, were a, a rifleman in the infantry, infantry or artillery. No, that? I was I was a, a mortar gunner. gunner. Okay. Uh, a uh, I was in the uh, the uh, weapons platoon of Company A of the 117th. Infantry, 30th Division, and uh, so it was the the weapons platoon were, consisted of of uh, air cooled, 30 caliber machine guns, and one mortar, and I was the mortar gunner uh, in that platoon, because that was the training I got at basic in Fort McClellan, was in the uh, heavy weapons, which was a larger mortar and water-cooled uh, 30 caliber machine guns, but um, the uh, rifle companies had just uh, uh, a air-cooled machine guns and the smaller, a, a, a smaller caliber uh, mortar, you know. So I was the I was a mortar gunner. And How did you know where to target a mortar? Where did the instructions come from? The instructions came from, uh, of course, you had a a, um, uh, a platoon leader, and he was given instructions, you know, from the forward observers, as to you know where they needed fire laid down. And so it was uh, what we were always trying to do was to, uh, you know, kind of lace an area with, with mortar fire where 
uh, the enemy was moving towards you or, uh, or, or leaving where they were, if they were, if they had a column of troops leaving a, uh, a town or a village or a position, why then you were trying to drop mortars on them as they were leaving, you know, to, to, so. Now, okay, you're in France. Where do you go from there? In, in France at the, I, I was on August 7th, I was captured on August 7th. Whereabouts? At uh, a place called uh, St. Bethany, which was a small village that was just outside of the larger city of Mortain, which was, the, the Battle of Mortain was the most significant uh, that took place on the Cherbourg Peninsula. And it was uh, during the Battle of Mortain that I and part of my squad uh, was captured. And uh, as Colonel, I didn't know this until the other day when Colonel Parks in his, in his uh, talk about the, the Battle of Mortain uh, said that there were 271 uh, persons from the 117th Infantry in that particular battle on that day that were either killed or captured. Well, as it turned out, they thought I was killed, but I was not. I was captured. And uh, they, they marched us to a town called Alencon, uh, Alencon, France. And uh, from there, after about a day and a half, they put us on uh, stake-bodied trucks and took us into a uh, rail yard just on the outskirts of Paris and put us in uh, boxcars, the 40 and 8 boxcar, which is 40 horses and, or 40 men and, and 8 horses. Um, and uh, after, it wound up taking us about three weeks to get to the uh, camp that I was assigned to, the prison camp. So where, which, where, did, where did you stay at night then when they stopped? In the boxcars. You were in the boxcars all the time. And it took us what, what would normally have been about maybe a eight day trip, it took us almost three weeks because while we were in France, every night the French resistance was blowing up the railroad track ahead of us to try to free us. Well, of course, they didn't have enough men to, uh, to do anything more than uh, blow up the railroad track. So then we had to back up and go off another route. So we were having, the, we were changing our route all the time, all the time we were in France with, which was a lot of delay, is the way it worked out. Uh, you know, good intentions gone awry. And uh, uh, anyway, I wound up uh, uh, at the, the final location during the rest of the war was at a place called Stalag 7A and it was in Moosburg, Germany. Moosburg is a small town that is about uh, 40 kilometers north uh, uh, northwest of Munich. So it's on the, it was on the Audubon from Munich to Prague. And uh, so that's where I spent, uh, you know, the, from, well, I arrived there uh, uh, around the end of August and uh, uh, I was in that area, although I didn't spend very much time. I spent only about, of the nine and a half for so months, I was a prisoner of war. Uh, I was really in the camp only about uh, 
three of those months just during the cold winter months when the ground is frozen. The rest of the time I was assigned to uh, work on, uh, on farms. And uh, as it turned out, why it was a real blessing. It wasn't anything I wanted to do, but the story was when you first came into the camp, uh, they gave you a card, you put your name and army serial number and what you did as a civilian before you got into the service. The story was, you know, everybody was filling out the cards. The story was, well, tell them uh, that you were a farmer and they'll put you out on a farm. Well, <clears throat> I didn't want to go on a farm. I had no idea what that entailed. And uh, as it turned out, the Germans, after they, they sort through all of these, these cards and so forth, the record of everybody that came into the camp at that time, and picked out everybody that I put down student, because that was the truth. And uh, I thought it was about as innocuous as you could be yet. And anyway, the Germans went through there, picked out all of those that had put down student, and put them on what they put called foreign commandos, which were just groups, you know, squads, we would say. Uh, but they put you on a farm commando and put you out on a, uh, a village that uh, had a, comprised of, of farms, the way they have their system in Germany. And so I went out by the end of August, uh, first part of uh, September, I was out working on a farm. And the farmer that you worked for fed you, so you and you ate with that farmer. And uh, so it, uh, you had to work hard, but the Germans worked hard. And uh, when I, when it finally got too cold to uh, work on the farm anymore because the ground froze, uh, up to that time we had been picking potatoes and harvesting potatoes, uh, putting up and cutting and putting up silage for the winter for the cattle. It was the, those were the kind of things we did. And uh, uh, by about December 15th, uh, there wasn't anything we could do around there. There was no more work for us because of the, uh, because of the weather and so on. And uh, they sent us back to the prison camp to Stalag 7A. And in, seven, in the Stalag, uh, every other day they would put us at uh, about 4.30 in the morning, they'd put us on a train that would take us the 40 kilometers into Munich, into the rail station, and then take us to areas uh, where there were bombed out buildings. Because during that time of the war, uh, either the British or the Americans were night bombing the large cities every night, you know, so that uh, but we were cleaning up bomb rubble, you know, separating the, the brick buildings, uh, wood into one pile, brick to another, and so on. And uh, so that's the kind of thing I did in the wintertime. And uh, uh, How many I, guys were with you at the time when you were doing this? When we were doing this, there was probably, probably in a cleanup group, there was probably about 40, maybe. How many guards did they have then? Uh, uh, well, what they had, you walked everywhere except for the rail car trip from okay. Mooseburg into Munich. You got off in the rail yards and then you walked to whatever building had been blown up that night and started cleaning up the rubble and separating it into... So they had four or five, six, seven, eight guards? Uh, they would have about... Uh, they would have on an average, I would say, about five, about five guards, you know, for to... Uh, Did anyone try to escape? Because there's no, no place to go. Well, there was no place to go, and at that time, no. 
They, they didn't. There wasn't a. Once uh, when I was working on a farm, two of the fellows escaped during the night, broke out a panel in the door, and went out that way. Unfortunately, two days later, they were in, uh, in solitary confinement back in the camp, you know, because you couldn't accumulate. The thing is, unless you were fluent in German or, and, and you know, so that uh, you could uh, blend with the German people in traveling anywhere, there was no place you could go unless you traveled only at night. And to do that, of course, you'd have to be able to accumulate enough food so you could. And we were not really that far from Switzerland. We would probably, we were probably maybe a hundred kilometers from Switzerland uh, in the area that that I was in. And uh, if you had the supplies, uh, you know, it could accumulate them. Or if you were fluent in German so that you could pass as a German or uh, one of the slave laborers that they had all kinds of there, you know, Ukrainians and and uh, Polish and so forth, people that they'd captured and, you know, uh, put into working in their factories and so on. You know, unless you could pass like a, a person like that, why? And of course, there were very few Americans that could do that, you know, that, uh, but so that uh, trying to escape in the winter time, it was, you know, Possible. it, uh, you know, it would not lead you anywhere, but, you know, back into solitary confinement is, you know, if they didn't shoot you in the process of recapturing you, you know. Were uh, the guards then with your group mean, like the Japanese guards no, were? No, no, they were not. Okay. No, they were not. The guards that uh, that had that we had in the camps were people that were too old to be up on the front line. Uh, they were guys that were uh, that I would guess would were from oh I don't know maybe the youngest might be 45, the oldest would be 70, you know, people in that range, and. Uh, so that uh, they weren't, there is only one experience I had like that. There was where there was a, a, one of the guards in the camp, you know, took off after me for what reason I never did figure out with the butt of his rifle, you know. But uh, outside of that, I, you know, I did not have uh, any of the uh, experiences that you see uh, you know, in, in movies and of the, the Japanese uh, internment camps. And uh, the, the Germans were less likely to do that sort of thing. If you happen to be up in a prison camp, up in the northern part of Germany and the uh, Russians came in, you were in serious trouble, but... Uh, as, there, as a U.S. prisoner, the Russians would be a problem for you? Uh, they they were the, the on the farm the f farm that uh, you know farms I worked on I was always getting the qu questions from uh, you know the Germans around there that you'd run into you know working the fields or whatever you know are the uh, are the Russians going to move come in here well that was down we're like I say it's we, that we, we, were, we were down in the area of uh, southeast Germany is, is where I was. And, of course, I had no idea, but I always say no. No, the Germans are not going to come in here. The Americans are going to come in here. Well, that gave them great relief <laughs> to, to know that and <laughs> or to think that. But, of course, I had no idea who was coming in. And uh, did, did the people you were working for on the farms did they realize things were not going well? Uh, if they did, they didn't. Say uh, they didn't show. say so. They didn't, you know. They didn't talk much about it. But 
Well, now, when you left this camp, was the war over then when you left? Or well, how'd you get what, out? The way I got out was uh, in March, they started uh, uh, putting together commandos to go out back out on the farms to get uh, the fields fertilized and planted, you know, for, for the farmers. Uh, and uh, I volunteered for the first farmer commando that went out about the end of March. And that's where I was uh, when I was liberated. I was on a, working on a farm in a small village called uh, Gross Eisenach. And uh, uh, the, my routine on, the, on, on that farm, I, was, I happened to have learned enough German uh, so that in the village that I was in, I was the interpreter because I was a rotten interpreter, but I was also the only one of about 18 Americans in, that were working in that village that uh, could converse with the Germans, you know. So, so I was the person that uh, the so-called interpreter in, in that village. And on a Sunday morning, why I was cleaning the barn, which was my routine. I would go out, clean the barn, come in and have breakfast, you know, in the kitchen of the uh, with farmhouse with the uh, rest of the people that uh, uh, ate there. There were there was a farmhand, a German fellow. I never did understand why he was there, but he worked as a farmhand. the The farm was owned by a lady. Her two brothers were apparently not too well liked politically because they were both on the Russian front. And that's what the Germans did with the uh, people that got on the, got crosswise of the Nazis. They usually wound up on the Russian front. Uh, and uh, so anyway, I was cleaning the barn, heard a lot of racket down uh, down the street of the main street of the this village, and I went out and looked. All of the Americans that were in this village were all gathered in kind of a circle. I thought, Jesus, you know, a couple of them are fighting. Is what I assumed. So I went in and walked down there to see what was going on. Well, they were all gathered around a a uh, a corporal standing there with, from the 20th Armored Division, he had a carbine over his shoulder and wanting to buy eggs. And uh, so a couple of the fellows took him over to one of the farmers. He bought his eggs and th during the night, why the 20th Armored had bivouacked over the hill on the other side of the Audubon. And uh, he walks over in, down into the village to buy eggs. I went back, finished cleaning the barn, went in and had breakfast, had my breakfast, went back to the beer stube, which was the center of the village, uh, and uh, got, I had a few belongings, some, uh, a few momentous, some uh, letters that I had gotten when I was in prison camp, a picture that I had, why don't you get that picture, would you, Ethel? The, the the one that the Polish fellow did. Well, you, you must have known when you saw that corporal that the U.S. troops were close by. Right, I knew that. But it uh, it was nothing to get really excited about. What we did, I gathered what gathered, what belongings I had from from my bunk there at that at the beer stew. We were down at the lower. Uh, level of the beer stube. It was kind of a, a split level building. And uh, I and a couple of the other fellows just walked up and stood on the Audubon, uh, which was just on one edge of the... That was, I brought that along. That was 
that, that is a picture that was drawn by a, uh, yeah, that was a picture drawn by a Polish freedom fighter that was captured in Warsaw in uh, January of 1945. Uh, and he and a number of other of those uh, people wound up in the prison camp at Stalag 7A and I paid uh, eight American cigarettes to have him draw that picture of me. And uh, hmm. it, uh, anyway, that was that and a few other things I gathered up and we're, we were up on the Audubon and a colonel came along in a Jeep and we flagged him down and we asked him, you know, what kind of arrangements have been made for liberated POWs. He said, none. He said, my, ex my uh, advice to you is get as far back towards France, you know. Go far, as far west as you can, as quickly as you can. Well, we hitchhiked back because there were trucks, Army, U.S. Army trucks hauling supplies up to the front in going back for more. So they were uh, going back and forth all the time. And we would, those going back, why we had uh, hitch a ride with them. How did you back. know you weren't Germans? Of course, we were always, we had American uniforms on. Oh, you did, okay. Yeah, we were, we were always in American uniforms. So be, the prison camp that uh, had uh, a, a warehouse with, uh, you know, American uniforms uh, so that uh, when you came in, I came into camp, you know, in August, so I didn't have any cold weather clothing. But uh, when it started, when, it, when, when I came back to camp from working on the first farm, why I was issued an overcoat and a warm pair of pants and uh, my shoes and everything were all still okay so but uh, so we were always in American uniforms and uh, so that's the way they that's the only thing we wound up going back to an area called Elwagen, uh Germany it was back up here now when you got your stuff to leave the guards that didn't try to stop you no I don't know where they were even. Oh. I don't even know where they were. Uh, the in, one of the interesting things that happened to me was the Saturday night before. Uh, there was, when I came to the dinner table in the evening, um, there was a lady that was renting a room in this farm uh, who had come from Berlin and she had been there for about three or four weeks there then but also here sits a German general and uh, so I sat down at the table at the place I always sat and uh, got to visiting with him and uh, Did he, he speak English or just German? Quite well. Oh. He could speak English quite well and he told me that uh, uh, he had a son that five years earlier was captured in North Africa. And the son was put in a prison camp in Alabama. Hmm. And he said, you know, he said as a, an officer in the German army, he said, my son in Alabama had much better food and clothing than I. He said that uh, apparently they had conversed an awful lot anyhow. But he wound up, he's, he, his story was, you know, whether any of this is true, I have no idea. But uh, 
he said he planned on uh, surrendering the next day. Uh, at the time of dinner, there was going th down the main street and through the, there was a column of, of uh, uh, German troops moving through that area with their equipment and so forth. And their, their equipment consisted of horse-drawn wagons. And if they had a truck, it was the kind that had a uh, wood alcohol generator built on the side of it to run the engine. And uh, a pretty sad lot. Did the general say why he wanted to surrender just to get away from the... No. He didn't say. The, it was the, it was obvious apparently to him mm. that you know it was uh, anything they could do nothing more you know any additional resistance was just useless right. you know it was did he uh, say anything that like he didn't want to surrender to the Russians he wanted to surrender to the Americans well he wanted to surrender to the Americans yeah. there's no way. He wouldn't have been surrendering if he was having to surrender to the Russians. Yeah. It, uh, he would have, I, I can tell you, yeah. he would have made some other arrangements, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, he gave me his spurs, which I still have. Spurs, horse spurs? Or yes. Hiding the horse? Yeah, yeah. Okay. right, because the, uh, you know, high echelon officers you know, usually wore uh, uh, boots, you know, riding boots yeah. and breeches is what, you know, most of them wore, which is what he did. And with the boots, why, of course, there was the spur, you know, that had a rowl about that long on the back of it. But... Uh, okay, now so you're, you're back with your own people. I'm, what I got, happens next? I got back to L Wagon, Germany. And the first thing they did would put us in a pool and they had um, uh, people that from the, uh, uh, you know, intelligent division of the services that uh, did a lot of questioning of you to find out whether you really were an American. Because there were a lot of people there that were Germans that had put on American uniforms and we're going to try to pass, you know, to, uh, to get out of there, you know. And, uh, but uh, anyway, those, when they decided that you really were a legitimate American soldier, you went into one area. And uh, when they accumulated enough, why they brought in the old C-47 uh, transport plane and they flew us from El Wagon to La Harve on the France, France La Harve, France on the uh, Cherbourg Peninsula and after about two weeks there waiting why uh, they put us on the uh, troop transport the Ile de France which also happens to be the same boat that I came from uh, New York to Southampton on, but it, so I wound up going back to New York City on the Ile de France, and uh, from there, why they give you papers that gave you a, d a delay, a 30-day delay en route, so you could go home and then uh, report back to uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas. For was the war over yet then? No, it We're was still not. Going on. It was. It had, it was just ending in France. I mean, in, in, Ger in, in Europe. Okay. It had just ended in Europe. And uh, uh, by the time we got to, by the time we got to New York City, the war in Europe was over. Okay. But of course, the uh, uh, Pacific War didn't end until what, about a month or six weeks after that, you know. And uh, so it was, but then from, from Hot Springs, Arkansas, I was uh, transferred to Fort Lawton, 
uh, Washington, which is right in the city of Seattle. And uh, we were taking small arms from troops coming from the Pacific and, and rebuilding them and cleaning them up and boxing them and uh, you know, coating them with cosmoline, creating them and putting them in storage. And so that's what I did until I had accumulated enough points for discharge. And uh, they had a point system then, which the details I knew well then, but the details of it I've forgotten now. But uh, I do know that uh, the Purple Heart uh, gave me five points. I remember that. But what the was the Purple Heart for? Being wounded in combat. Did you get hit in the hand or something? I was wounded in the left hand. A piece of shrapnel went through my, through the palm here and came out the back here. And, and you, where were you when that happened? I was, that was during the time of the, uh, I was fighting that was going on when I was captured. Okay. And uh, actually the wound was, was dressed by a German medic but I, you always carried the uh, uh, self uh, drugs and bandages yourself, you know, carried your own too. Well, he used that to take care of the, and it uh, took a lot of years, but finally it's even the, even the old uh, scars have disappeared if you live long enough. <laughs> so. No, no. At what point did you leave Washington and get discharged, and then go back to where? Deep River. I, when I, uh, uh, after I had uh, accumulated enough points uh, for discharge, I was sent down to, from Fort Lawton to uh, Fort Lewis, uh, Washington, which was a uh, a camp where they were doing a lot of processing uh, of discharges. So I was down there. They gave you enough money to take a, a, plane, a train from, uh, from Fort Lewis back to wherever you lived, and I went back to Thief River Falls. So after discharge uh, in, uh, uh, in November in, uh, from Fort Lewis, uh, I went back to Thief River, and I was back in Thief River uh, about uh, Thanksgiving. I was back there by Thanksgiving. Did you have, a, you, you have any brothers? I, I did. I've got, uh, uh, or I had, uh, three brothers. And, did uh, they have to serve too, or they too young? They were too young. Okay. They were all too young. I was the oldest in the family. And, uh, but they were all too young. I have a brother for this presentation for the uh, 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 Legion of uh, Le Legion of Honor thing. Uh, my brother that lives. I've got a brother that lives in in uh, Denver, Colorado, and he was here for that. So he came. I think he's in the video we did earlier. Yeah, I think probably. Yeah. 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 Well, then, when you was your family in farming? In no, they weren't. My dad was a uh, uh, an engineer, and uh, he did. He was in construction, like you know, uh, road construction. Right. Uh, he did the. He was one of three contractors that built the spillway for the largest earth-built dam in the world at Fort Peck, Montana. You know, things like That's that is what he did. Well, what so, did you settle into when you got back? When I got back, I got uh, uh, on the 2nd of January of 1946, I started school at Michigan Tech. And uh, I had the GI Bill uh, that gave you, depending on how long you'd served and what your circumstances were, gave you a certain number of days of education, you know. Well, I had enough so that uh, 
I uh, went to Michigan Tech and I had enough time so that I uh, got two degrees at Michigan Tech, one in mining engineering and the other was in metallurgical engineering. So, and from there why I went to work uh, for a construction company that was uh, building a new mine at Grand Rapids and you know. Have you ever gone back to Germany after the I war? have, no I have not. Okay. No, I have not. No desire? Well, yeah, a desire, but uh, just, Why? just not the, you know, the, just the, I could have made the opportunity, but it didn't easily present itself, you know, so. Right. But, uh, it, uh, but if I ever were to go back, the places I would like to have gone was not where I was captured, and it, like at Mortain, but I would like to go back to the farms that I worked on, you know, I'm at sure. the time. But I'm sure there's people who are gone. And oh, all together. together. But I'd really like to see what, yeah, the first farm I was on, they had uh, the wife, of course. The husband was gone. That was the problem. Of course, there was no men around, see. And uh, so that's the reason that they were, uh, almost every farm, well, every farm I was involved with, had a usually a Ukrainian uh, uh, captured slave laborer, we call them, you know, uh, that were that, that worked on the farms, you know, helped with the planting, harvesting, and taking care of the cattle and so forth. And uh, but that just wasn't enough. They so they were. That's why they were you know, taking fellows from the prison camp and putting them out on the farms to, particularly at times of harvest and, you know, then in the spring planting. I drove a horse and an ox team, hauling manure out on the fields and putting it in piles that we'd come out later then and scatter around. That's it. Everything was done by hand. James, thank you for allowing me to take your time. Well, thank you for doing so. I appreciate it.